Okay, so imagine any big city in the year 2050. So just close your eyes and con conjure up a picture of what you might think in 2050 any big city would look like. So think about maybe robots or flying taxis, driverless cars. You might think about congestion, poor air quality. If you're me, I'm just wondering whether the England football team will ever beat Germany on penalties. <laughs> but what I can say, I can't speculate on any of this, but what I can say with some certainty is that you will share the same space with twice as many people. Twice as many people will be moving around your city in the same number of vehicles. You'll consume just 20% of the energy you consume today, and most of this will be delivered renewably. So it's an amazing future we have to deliver. And I can say it with some certainty because there are some big mega trends really driving this change. Have a look at the clock just in the bottom left hand corner. It's going up in years. Okay, this is a model from the Yokohama Institute, the world's largest supercomputer modeling surface air temperatures from 1950 up to the year 2100. Okay, you can see it's rapidly getting to 2015. And this is what will happen if we don't deliver the future that I've described a future where we can bring our energy footprint down considerably. 2025, most cities on the planet have committed to over 50% energy reduction. This is what will happen if we don't get there. 2050, most cities are at 80%. And at 2070, I will turn 100, or be dead, and get a telegram from the king, not sure which one. And by the year 2100, Probably our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will wonder, did we deliver a legacy that's worth talking about? And we'll come back to this in a moment. To solve this issue, you have to wonder how wasteful cities are. This is London from space at night. Okay, that's what they see, incredibly wasteful environment. And if you look at the pressures of urbanization on our cities, poverty, terrorism, urban unrest and flooding are increasing in all of the big cities in the world without exception. Coupled to this, our whole demographic change within cities is incredible. The best way to illustrate this, in the year 2000, there were just two billion children on Earth. How many will there be in the year 2100? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a moment to consider one billion, two billion, 3 billion or 4 billion. So hold a number in your head. We asked a typical UK audience. This is how they voted. Okay. And I can tell you the answer is 2 billion. So the number of children on Earth will not go up. The entire increase in our population of around 3 to 4 billion will come simply from people living longer. Interestingly, this is stolen from Hans Rosling, but if you asked a monkey the same question, this is how they would have voted. <laughs> proving that a monkey is four times more likely to get the right answer than a UK audience. So there you go. <laughs> but these things are not in our distant future. I can tell you after Hurricane Sandy in New York, people lost power for three months. People in intensive care in hospitals were having to be bused to different hospitals that had power. Okay, this is an amazing consequence of man-made climate change hitting our cities today. In Bangkok, the flooding was so catastrophic that businesses stopped investing there. So the long-term economic impacts for a city like Bangkok are incredible. On top of the loss of life, this is just something that our cities need to legislate against. And in places like Ho Chi Minh City, this is a common occurrence, the traffic stopping, people not being able to get to their places of business. This has huge consequences for the way people live their lives in our cities. And in cities like London, where we have huge train stations as alternatives to road traffic, this is the main train station in Ho Chi Minh City. That is it, one train station. So we have to think very creatively about ways of solving these problems in our cities. 
And it's a big problem. 75% of the world's cities live in exposed coastal zones. And all of this has to be done in the face of protecting the quality of life that we come to expect in our cities. Now, I sound incredibly de depressing. I'm sorry about that. But the good news is coming. Cities do respond. Cities are unique, actually. And the best point I can do, this is Pope Sixtus the Sixth. I can only say that sober. <laughs> this is one of the Roman popes placed six obelisks into the city of Rome, OK? And this is Rome today, so perfectly built on the vision of the Pope, OK? And in 1666 in London, after the Great Fire, London had a very similar plan. But this is what they built. Completely different, completely ignored the plan. Cities are unique. They behave differently. They do not respond the same way. And the key for the survival of our cities and combating these big mega trends that are hitting them is actually thinking about how you get things done in these environments. This is London's governance structure. That's how you get things done in London, OK? Somewhere in the middle is the mayor of London, trying to make sense of it all, OK? And in the face of all of this, air quality in London is killing 4,267 people prematurely every year. So imagine in places where it's more visible, like Moscow or Beijing. But this is in a typical European city. This is the kind of scale of impact. And the problem in cities is they're wonderful places for people to complain. They complain daily. If you upset a taxi driver, they all drive around City Hall, beeping their horns for eight hours. Yeah? I tell you, earplugs don't work. OK? So what is the answer? How do we find solutions to this? Well, you can't solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. You must learn to see the world anew. And I do like this quote, because often we take a, a solution that we have and we try and recreate it and adapt it slightly. But it's not going to work. Remember, twice as many people moving through the city, and we've got to keep the same number of vehicles. So how do we do it? Well, I have a very, very simple solution. It's great. This is, this is better than London, because everyone has a seat. <laughs> huh? And they're happy, too. Oh. Try that on a summer's day on London Tube. That's not going to get the same result. And if you look, as, apart from the roads that could be much more efficient with this wonderful delivery mechanism for people and goods, you should also look at uh, cycle lanes. They're incredibly wasteful. This is an awful use of space in our cities. I'm going to be now extremely popular with the cycling community. Cycling is wonderful, but we need to cram more of them into these spaces, and we need to think more creatively how we do that. <laughs> this is a better way of using those lanes a bit more efficiently. And actually, you can imagine in those cycle lanes something like this, people hopping on and off with their goods and getting to where they need to go. This could be an efficient way of doing it. I have a smart version of this. It's not actually that smart. Um, but the principle is good. You have a nice small vehicle in these bike lanes, and you cram people in and out. And your big truck with people hopping on and off in the main lanes. And actually, you know, that's what buses were created for. This is the, as Boris describes, the hop on, hop off, fall over route master bus in London. And um, actually, this is not a bad way of getting things done. But we must clean up. Whatever solution we come up with, we need new hybrid vehicles. It's my hybrid solution. Quite nice. <laughs> I can imagine that going down Westminster to see the Queen. This would be wonderful. And we need to also think very differently about the way we park our vehicles. This is Moscow. 10% of congestion is added in Moscow as a result of people driving around looking for a parking space. This is incredible in this day and age that we cannot overcome these sorts of things. But the good news is cities are solving it. Go back to Bangkok. They built an elevated train which does exactly what I said. It puts twice as many people through the same corridor in the city. And they've even grown lovely green spaces around 
the uh, uh, elevated train line. And this is how a future solution might look like. And delivering people at a second tier level within the city, allowing people to disperse through the city more easily. And actually, if you push this concept forward and we take our lovely Afghan truck, we could create a straddle bus that moves people over the traffic faster than the traffic, delivering people on and off through the city, getting people to work and home and through to their busy lives much more easily. And probably the ultimate solution will be a taxi, not one that I need to hail. But I have a smartphone which tells anybody who wants to know exactly where I am. If I just tell it where I want to go, then this taxi should find me, should pick me up from the roadside, and the most efficient journey to the place that I need to get to. And the only downside with this modern futuristic taxi is it still has a driver. So you rip out the driver's seat, and you get even more space for passengers. We can have a driverless society in our cities before 2050. The technology is available today. You can see I'm going to be bloody popular with the taxi trade. OK. But cities are solving it. So this is London. They have plans for a low-carbon future, bringing people out of fuel poverty. They're embracing the diversity of the city and trying to rebalance inequalities that exist across the whole place. They have a plan for doing two million additional street trees, so protecting the natural environment while dealing with the consequences of rapid urbanization and climate change. And a whole plan for micro-renewables across the city, enabling our buildings and our homes to be mini power stations, not big consumers of energy. So flipping this whole thing onto its head. And then using tools like low emission zones and congestion charging, will enable us to drive to this low emission, low carbon future much more quickly and much more easily. And this actually reminds me, when the Pope, Pope Benedict, the one who retired, came to London, and Boris did the best deal ever for London, because he gave the Pope Mobile an exemption to the congestion charge. It was genius, because in return, the Pope agreed to absolve the sins of all Londoners. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we deliver this change quickly enough? Well, actually, if you look around the world, Shanghai, digital upgrades to all of its building stock, enabling much better, more efficient buildings operating without any kind of delays, meaning more businesses locating there. If you look at Istanbul, they have a citywide energy retrofit scheme for all of the buildings and they've retrained long-term unemployed into green jobs and are placing them into these roles, solving both an economic and environmental problem. Even in Moscow, they're moving big parts of the city out into new territories, moving the homes with the jobs to solve inner city congestion. And places like Buenos Aires, solving historic severance issues through the city, enabling communities to be reconnected, bringing down crime rates, bringing businesses back in. So everything is connected, but these solutions are really emerging. And actually, we can accelerate these. This goes back to 2005. This is Pope Benedict. OK, wonderful picture. Seven years later, when Pope Francis came in. <laughs> Same picture. It's an amazing transformation. The way we can now deliver packets of information to people's handheld will completely transform the citizen experience, enabling us to forget about parking and forget about all of the things that annoy us as we go through our daily lives in the city. How do we know it's all working? Well, actually, if you look at research from LSE cities, with GDP growth, we're seeing big, big reductions in car use, switching to different modes of transport. And if you look at what cities are doing as they grow in terms of their energy reduction, we're seeing amazing uh, uh, leadership from cities compared to their national counterparts. <laughs> now, <laughs> things don't always go to plan, or we get surprises after the fact. It doesn't matter. Cities should be bold. They should take decisions where national governments fail. 
Cities have the power to keep their citizens happy to do these projects, even if they don't quite deliver the returns that we hope for. The key in this world is about experimentation to really save our cities. And this just leads me to the last few pictures. These are my children. This is Tessa, Jacob, and Albert, and my chickens, Daphne and Josephine. <laughs> and I've since gained a child and lost a chicken, actually. It's an old picture. Better that way around. <laughs> I hear you. And this was actually an experiment to show you what 80 liters of water looks like. Okay? This is the zero carbon definition of water use per person per day. And if I told you in the US they consumed 280 liters per person per day. In Europe, we consume 220 liters. South America, 180 liters. Africa, 120 liters. We are still not good enough. And if we can begin to look at the resources around us that we control, how we travel, how we consume energy, how we consume water, we can begin to have a real measurable impact on these things. It inspired me to buy a well so that I can bring my water use down considerably. And now you know what happened to the chicken. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's a joke, it's a joke. It's got a cover on it, it's got a cover on it. And we need to reconnect our lives much more with nature. We're seeing places like Dubai who are putting natural districts, tree planting, wonderful natural resources into their new city environments. They're thinking about this far more than we are in our European cities. So we have to think much more carefully. And my last picture really just illustrates that you can coexist in busy rush hour traffic in London on a Friday afternoon. Here's the picture. We can live in our spaces, in our urban centers, without any big issues. So my conclusion is, none of this is easy. It really is not. Doing these projects takes a lot of stakeholder alignment, a lot of guts. It's working with the media, it's working with politicians, it's working with all of the difficult people that we deal with in life. But actually, when you look at the solutions that we have in front of us, they're very, very limited. And we spend a long time worrying about which solution might work or not work, when actually that choice is very easy. And we should just focus on picking something and moving forward. And that's probably my conclusion. It's not easy, but it is simple. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>